Cabin John, Maryland, and attended the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He is co-founder and creative director of authors, publishers, and readers of independent literature, also known as April, a festival celebrating small press publishers. So welcome to the alfresco portion of the evening. Um, and uh, as Tara's bio mentioned, um, uh, our friend Francis Dinger, um, who's now in Italy, um, having fun times, um, organized a public art thing down in Occidental Square, and I know Greg's got some stuff there. Um, Stacy Levine, uh, Richard Chim, Tara, myself, we all have stuff. And um, due to size uh, constraints, I had to cut mine like a lot, so I'm going to be reading sort of the beefed up version of that. And the other thing about that was, uh, due to no fault of Francis or the organizer, they misspelled my name. And so it was Wally Fitzgerald. <laughs> they misspelled mine too. Yeah, 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 exactly. So uh, this is a drag called uh, Methods of Inquiry, and it's by Wally Fitzgerald. <laughs> <laughs> they find a wall at the lake, or they find one on it. More accurately, they find a wall slightly above the lake, floating, and that's an issue of semantics, about two inches above the surface of the water. It's semantics because everyone agrees that floating is simply the easiest way of describing, despite describing it, despite the fact that the wall does not bob or sway or feature any movement whatsoever, instead sitting, like any other wall, on a plane, just one that doesn't exist. The first person to see it is a woman walking her dog on the paved path around the lake, the wall appearing like a line of redacted text on the flat, windless surface of the water in the pastel light of an early spring morning, a set of curious birds wheeling around the structure and settling. The wall is exactly 30 feet long, 12 feet high and a foot thick, and is made out of red brick laid in Flemish bond. The bricks laid thinner side out, arranged horizontally in a Morse coat of long, short, long, and offset vertically so that the short brick sits in the middle of the long bricks immediately above and below it. The bricks are of indeterminate make, the wall otherwise perfectly ordinary, accepting its presence above, literally like above, a municipal body of water. The phrase Flemish bond briefly enters the cultural lexicon due to its mention in a number of news stories that appear first on a local television station and then later on a national and then international level. A mason named George Ehrlich earns three national talk show appearances in a low level of celebrity after he rides out in a police skiff to investigate the wall and then returns to the shore to speak with reporters eager to learn more about the phenomenon. The lake is sort of squash shaped set in a gentle curve with two bulbous ends. 37,846 people live in the town, according to the most recent census. On the inside of the curve is a par three golf course and a dock in which sit a handful of brown-hulled wooden sailboats and paddle boats that are available for rent Thursday through Sundays at the rate of $8 an hour. Susan Graham, a 17-year-old honor student, becomes the first person to swim under the wall during a national telecast. According to a noted cultural critic, who happens to own a small timeshare at the lake's edge, two bathrooms, trellis with ill-kept ivy, blue kayak. The surreal and the banal have, in this small town combined, and unexpectedly created the first public instance of the extra-natural, close quote. A photographer for a local daily takes what's later known as the iconic photo of the wall, midday, three boats in the background, and a battlement of haggard gray seagulls, all facing left, on top of the weirdly moss-free wall. No one can explain that. Paddleboat rentals, understandably, go up. <laughs> During a lakeside interview, George Ehrlich is flummoxed by an arts journalist who, believing him to be the aforementioned cultural critic, and to be fair, they look a lot alike, asked the lifelong town residents, that's Hills High Baffled Roosters, class of 74, what exactly he means by the, quote, first public instance of the extra natural. More specifically, have there been private instances? <laughs> the Mason, who was wearing a green tie, unconsciously rotates his watch around his wrist and tries gallantly for an answer. Enthusiasm eventually wanes. The local police, having spent a large portion of their overtime budget guarding 
an object that does not move and does not appear to be anything or do anything but be, recall all but one of their boats and set up a ring of sad, algae-covered buoys around the wall. The first graffiti on the wall reads simply, quote, smoke cigs, y'all, close quote, <laughs> and is never attributed. <laughs> one night, weeks later, George Ehrlich takes a shower after work and the overhead light goes out in his, bathroom, in his bathroom and he is left in the hot water in the dark. He reaches out and fumbles for the vanity light, wet fingers slipping over the switch, and as the light comes on, he thinks of a man who earlier that day had approached him on the street because he, the man, recognized him, Ehrlich, but could not remember the context. Then Ehrlich pulls his hand back and slumps a bit, his body back to haplessly interrupting what water there is. Thanks. Yeah.